Hello and welcome. We're going to give everybody a little bit of time to sign into our exciting webinar today. Thank you so much for joining. I see the numbers rising of attendees. We're very happy to have you join us. I see a lot of people coming in. This is exciting. We know this is a hot topic, so we're very excited to have you today. All right, just a few more seconds. Welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you all here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I know that everybody is pressing on a link to try to get in here, so we will give you some more time, but we wanna go ahead and get started. My name is Jessica Kilman. I am the Director of Client Services with Sterling Martin Associates. Welcome to our Sterling Martin Associates webinar series. This is our August session, and the title of our session is The Next Frontier, AI and Chat GPT in Association Management. We're gonna go through just a few housekeeping items for Zoom. Uh, feel free to chat with us. We welcome any comments and any feedback that you have regarding this session. Um, we do have the Q&A open, so any questions that you have, we will be monitoring that. Hopefully, during this one-hour session, we will be able to answer your questions. However, we know we only have an hour. Um, we are also going to stay on if you want to stay on after, just for a few more minutes if we don't get to your questions. And if we, at that point, don't even get to your questions, because I know that we'll probably have quite a few, please feel free to contact any of our panelists. All right, I am going to turn this over to David Martin of Sterling Martin Associates. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome, everyone. My name is David Martin. I'm the CEO and managing partner of Sterling Martin Associates, and I am joined by Rebecca. Start off. Or, uh, really, Megan, I'm are really... you on mute? Yes, there I was you are brilliantly mute. on okay. mute. So you'd think after three years, I'd be better. Um, my name is Rebecca Stacha. I am the Chief Executive Officer for SAMPI, which stands for the Society for the Advancement of Materials and Process Engineering, a long title. Um, but yeah, I actually am, one of the things that I'd like to say is we're not all experts on AI, but we're learning like each of you. Um, we come from an association background and each of us has the interest in AI and we found it a lot of uh, times just banter things we're learning from each other and we felt like it was a great thing to share we had an opportunity to to speak on this at access which was a conference for CES that happened back in July and uh, we thought it was great to keep the conversation going Michael you want to take it away sure thanks Rebecca so Michael Jones I'm the vice president of mobile technologies at results direct and uh, so yeah so I uh, I get the opportunity to wear a lot of different hats uh, in my role and uh, so one of them is emerging technologies. So uh, so I'm the guy, you know, who back in the day, if you saw someone walking around with Google glasses on, that was me. Um, you know, if uh, if I've seen you at a conference in the last, you know, two years, I was the guy with the Oculus who was helping people get into the metaverse and all of that. And so obviously, as uh, as things have been evolving uh, in the AI space in this whole fourth industrial revolution, um, you know, that's been you know, a, a focal point. And so we're going to get to talk a little bit about some of that uh, adventure here. But uh, with that, I guess, uh, Khan, we're turning it over to you. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name's Khan Davis. Really, it's a society of scientists and engineers called SACE. Um, my panelists would want me to tell you that uh, I tried to hack into NORAD as a eighth grader because I was inspired by war games. Um, so I've been deep in technology since I was then. I did not get caught because we hacked it at friend's house. So uh, he got in trouble. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, I'm really interested in how AI will help us, what things to watch for. And, you know, it's such an emerging technology, so there's a lot of questions. Uh, just to share with you, in the last 
three months since we did this. Sherm has changed the template three times that I've been to. As you can tell, this keeps evolving. So I look forward to uh, uh, look forward to having a great conversation. So I'll turn it back to David. Thank you. Yeah, Khan, your uh, audio is just coming through uh, kind of blurred there. Um, and today, the topics that we plan to cover, um, how did we get here, impact to personal and workforce productivity, organizational chatbots, chat GPT and publishing, policies and ethics, role of associations, and now what? And I'll turn it over to the panel, I believe, Michael, to lead things off. Sure, sure. Let's jump in. So, uh, so for starters, you know, this topic is obviously all of the buzz right now, and we could spend uh, hours, days going through talking about, um, you know, different facets of artificial intelligence, or even just different facets of large language models and how it's been impacting things. So what we want to do to start off is we're going to run four polls. You should see the first one up right now. And what we want to do is we want to understand a little bit of those of you that are on the webinar today, where are you at in terms of your AI, you know, large language model, chat GPT journey, because that's actually going to influence what we talk about today. So if everyone could participate, that would be great. Um, this first one, of course, you know, just how familiar uh, are you with AI and, uh, and chat tools? And um, it looks like we have, uh, you know, somewhat familiar as the winner. So 73%, um, you know, I guess very familiar is is probably uh, probably hard to gauge. So, but uh, but some of you, it sounds like maybe haven't even used it at all. And so we are going to then take a little bit of time, uh, Rebecca and Khan today. Let's take a little bit of time just to define a little bit of what what these terms are that we're talking about as we go through. Um, let's put up our second poll. Um, and so again, have you used any of the following tools? So uh, so the first one is going to be, again, our large language model tools. So uh, ChatGPT, Google Bard, you know, things like that. The second category are going to be um, image, uh, text to image uh, generators. That would be like Dolly or Stable Diffusion or Bing. I mean, there's a ton of them now that are using that. Um, and then the third category is just, you know, you know, other AI tools. So um, so, yeah. So if you could uh, just give us a sense where you are there. And again, this is going to help us to understand where we're going with this. I know that uh, Rebecca, you've had some fun with the uh, you know image generators here recently. Why don't you talk about that for a moment? I was figuring you were going to ask me that. So you all saw when we popped up um, and when uh, David was first introducing us that I have a very lovely new headshot and I didn't have time with my new role. I'm, I'm very new into this CEO role here at Sampy, but I didn't have time to do a headshot. So I actually went online and I found one that did it with AI. I sent them about 10 to 15 selfies and they created that image for me. That is not me. I didn't sit for that. I don't own those clothes and I technically don't have those earrings. So um, it's a very interesting thing that you can do with AI and it was very inexpensive. It cost me a lot less in time, energy and money to get done. And it was a decent response. So AI generation on images is turning out to be both beneficial and helpful. I've actually had another, a number of associations suggest they do it for their board of directors because they can't get them all in one place and they would like to get them looking very good for their website. So it's a good cost-effective way to go about it. We'll share that link with you, I think, a little later in, in one of our um, follow-ups or distributions, I think, David, that we have a link to that. So we'll share it. Yeah, I was I was going to say that uh, we're going to reference a number of resources on this webinar. And of course, again, we could go so deep into so many of these topics. Um, there will be a follow up email. And I, that is one of the links, uh, Rebecca, that is going to go out with that. So but again, it looks like uh, it looks like a good number of you are familiar and have personally used um, some of the large language models. So let's fire up the third poll. Um, so how often are you using, uh, you know, these different tools in your personal uh, or professional lives? And uh, this one, I think, is particularly interesting, uh, especially considering that if we'd asked this question a year ago, <clears throat> we would be getting lots of crickets. Um, probably an, an interesting point, Khan. I know, uh, let's do this. This is a good opportunity to test your audio again. Um, but Khan, I know you were talking about how giving this talk is sort of fun because, you know, 10 minutes after we're done, everything has changed again. Do you want to maybe just comment on that for a minute? 
yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great now. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, Sherm, uh, templates on AI policy, I mean, I've checked it monthly now because it is evolving, it is changing. The, you know, the original Sherm policy that I saw was just a one page, of, don't use it. Right? Now it's evolved to different options, and we'll talk about that later. But, you know, I'm personally using a summarizer. Uh, I'm using uh, note taking for my some of my meetings. So there's so many tools that are literally being swamped daily that it's hard to stay on top. So I'd love to see uh, what you all are using because there was uh, about 20% of you are using other tools, other AI tools. So yeah, please share the wealth. Don't keep it all to yourself. Michael? Yep. Okay. So 11% using it every day, 13% weekly, 53% have put toes in the water. And 20, almost a quarter of you have never used uh, any of these tools. So again, we'll take a little bit of time. You, you'll get a lot of good ideas out of today's webinar. All right, last poll before we dive in. So what do you hope to gain from today's session? And again, this is just to help us make this as valuable as possible for everyone on today. Um, so, and, and you can read the choices there, but we'll uh, we'll keep this open really quick because we wanna, we wanna move on here. Um, so yeah, we'll roll through. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, stay updated. Yep. Uh, exploring it for personal and professional for personal use. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is good. This is kind of what we had hoped so that most of you are really looking for ways to identify how to use this at your organizations and, um, and a bulk of what we were hoping to talk about today is going to fit right into that. So, uh, so with that, Khan, I'm going to flip this to you. Why don't you tell us how did we get here? This may not surprise you, as I mentioned, the 1980 movie War Games, right? Some of us have been using advanced algorithms early in the 1980s, whether you were an IBM mainframe or a create computer. But the difference is that now it's very accessible. We are in uh, the fourth, what they call industrial revolution. So if I can get the next slide, there we go. Uh, so you can see the different re uh, industrial revolutions. Uh, this is considered the fourth. Uh, next slide, please. And the different things that are in the fourth industrial revolution, and it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, or ML, is just one of the different things that we're touching. This is the first wave, and this is just the first wave of artificial intelligence. And I really consider it machine learning, which is these very advanced algorithms. We're not even close to what I would consider artificial intelligence, but it's the buzzword. You know, there are other things like you know, personal uh, tracking of your health health uh, wares, uh, 5G, robotics, oh. internet of things. So there's a ton of stuff that once you integrate the stuff, the world's gonna look a lot different. So we're just on the cusp. Michael, you wanna dive in a little bit more about some of these uh, technology that's evolved recently from AI? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's kind of funny because when we were planning this talk and we were sharing ideas, I, I was like, you know, Back in 2018, uh, I did a fourth industrial revolution talk for an organization, and uh, I used the same slide that Khan used at this one. It's the free Wikipedia one, but it was funny because at the time we're like, "This is coming soon, right? This is this is this is on the horizon. You're going to see all this stuff." And uh, this year, it's the first time we've really been able to give the talk. We're like, "Oh, it's finally here!" And you know, the interesting thing about that is because when we look at sort of how AI has evolved in terms of the public. So again, as Khan was saying, artificial intelligence has been going on for decades. I mean, tools have been developed over decades. You know, a lot of really cool breakthroughs have happened. And we'll see more and more of that that you and I will never know about because it's happening in very, you know, it's, it's industry specific. It's, you know, behind closed doors, if you will. But when you look at what has happened in the public eye, I mean, back in 1997, you know, uh, you know, Deep Blue, you know, became the world chess champion, you know, and in 2011, you know, Watson, you know, won Jeopardy. And in 2016, you know, AlphaGo became the world's Go, you know, Go champion, right? So these things happened and they had virtually no impact on any of our lives. <laughs> they, they, they were sensational buzz, but we all went on, you know, and said, oh, that's interesting. It's kind of like something out of a movie. But in 2022, uh, OpenAI launched ChatGPT, and um, and that kind of changed everybody's life, really. You know, and the and the question is, well, why? What what was all of a sudden the difference? And 
you know, it helped, of course, that they were one of the fastest organizations to ever reach 100 million users. Uh, it took them about two months for people to, to sign up. But I remember watching an interview with one of the co-founders and, you know, and again, you know, I'm just repeating stuff I heard on the interview. But, you know, he he basically said something to the extent of AI has been, you know, behind the scenes happening for a long time. Major breakthroughs are happening. It's going to impact the world. It's going to impact everybody's life. But nobody knows what's going on. And so their idea of releasing a public beta was to get it into the hands of the masses before it became sort of this perfected tool, right? So that's that was the gist of it, right? And, and that's absolutely what happened. Because when ChatGPT launched, the buzz that went out, the media coverage, people started trying it. We all started trying it. And we realized oh man, this is actually something that, that we could use. This is something that, um, that, 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 you know, could impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now it is funny, I'll kind of, we'll, we'll banter on this for one second, um, because their usage went like up, 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 all the way up until, uh, you know, earlier in the summer, you know, back in June, all of a sudden traffic dropped like by almost 10%, right? And, uh, and of course, you know, the, the articles that I was reading were all saying, okay, that's it. The, the, the fad is over. The buzz has died down, you know, you know, another flash in the pan technology. And then I was talking to Khan and what did you, what did you share with me, Khan? So I have four kids. So this will give a reference. You know, it started uh, dropping in June and one of the articles like, oh yeah, uh, traffic to Minecraft went up. So the kids are logging into Minecraft rather using chat GP dropping down for their assignments. So there you go. There's the correlation of why it dropped down. Yeah. So we don't know for sure, but we think maybe uh, all of a sudden they stopped doing all their schoolwork, right? So uh, so anyway, so that was the idea there. So where this starts to tie in, and this is kind of our first big topic, is you know the impact that this is having to personal and workforce productivity. Um, and, and I will say that this is a very interesting one for me because um, you know I've I've read and and kind of gone through now. Uh, a ton of different articles and and study. Everyone's doing case studies and and surveys and things like that to try to figure out what is the impact going to be on different industries. The funny thing is that all of them have a different industry on top. You know, one says, okay, the the industry that's going to have the most uh, automation occur uh, because of AI tools is banking, and then the next one says advertising, and the next one says marketing. So. You know, I don't think there's really a definitive answer here, except to say that a lot of organizations are looking at how can they integrate these tools into the day-to-day -day operations of their staff and, and the people that work in those fields to see what kind of automation could happen. Um, Rebecca, I don't know, do you want, do you want to, you know, share on that one real quick? Uh, and I've got a couple of case studies too, if, if you want me to. Um. And is that, is that one coming back to Watson and Woodside, or do you want me to just talk about the part with associations? Um, do, we, we, do Watson. That's okay. awesome. <laughs> so Watson and Woodside. Um, Woodside is actually an oil and gas company. My my life before Sampy uh, dealt with oil and gas association. And Watson and that large company out of Australia actually got together and put a, a fairly big um, effort in back prior to 2020. I think it was like 2019. Um, that they used AI at that time to kind of go through all of their documentation and everything behind that and put together the concept of how can we create something, a AI tool that will be really a great tool in the field for our engineers. And one of the quotes that came out of that was we can do with AI what we could do with a thousand engineers. Um, AI can kind of be that sort of replacement. So it shows the fact that there's just dynamics about maybe doing rudimentary calculations in, in the engineering space or doing some of the tasks that and freeze the engineers they are hiring up to do different tasks. So it is really kind of talking about how some of the professions that we support as associations are going to be impacted by the fact that these tools exist. It's going to try and take some of the base issues out and try and automate those. Same way you are talking about how do I do my notes? How do I, how do I capture my minutes in a more efficient manner. They're trying to do the same thing in a lot of different associations, industries. So does that help, Michael? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great example. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you guys a quick stat from uh, the latest uh, McKinsey Global Survey. 
you know, they said that one quarter of surveyed C-suite executives say they are personally using generative AI tools for work. Um, and then 40% uh, of respondents said that the organizations will increase their investment in AI overall because of advances in generative AI. Um, and then the other one I thought was kind of interesting, and this is uh, out of uh, Cambridge Center, but they said that um, banks have already begun incorporating AI into their business models. 56% of banks claim that they've implemented technology into their business domains. So again, just some interesting uh, you know, industries that we're seeing being impacted. But these are some examples of you know, ways that, again, we're not talking about all AI. We're just mostly talking about large language models. We're talking about tools like ChatGPT. But these are some of the ways that we're seeing, um, you know, people use them personally and professionally. Um, you know, I know on a personal level, uh, you know, that I have used this for writing, pretty much just writing. So it, it's helped me to write better. I sound smarter when I use it. So um, so that's been that's been one thing in particular for me. But, um, you know, Connor, Rebecca, what are some of the things that you're seeing people doing um, or that you yourself are doing to use some of these tools like uh, ChatGPT in your professional or personal lives? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I'm starting to do some note taking. So you can jump on and someone mentioned in chat Otter. That's a great one. Uh, so you don't have to type notes while you're trying to talk and trying to engage your folks. You just have Otter literally will pop up the screen and it will record all the notes and some of it will actually give you an action item. I think there are others who will generate an email that if it's an action item, will email it to you and say, hey, this is what I recorded and this is your action item. So it, it's great. It's not perfect, by the way. So don't, don't assume that it, it will capture everything 100%, you know, but it does a fairly decent job. And I know a lot of small business folks are, are using it. Uh, so that's what I, I use. And then the other thing is the summarization. Uh, you know, these really dense articles, huge articles, you can have that summarized for you in a very concise manner. It can basically give you an executive summary of what the article is talking about. So if you have a report or research paper that's hundreds of pages, you can feed that to the model and it will give you an executive summary. So you can, again, to your point, Michael, you can sound a lot smarter can <laughs> you really are. <laughs> so that's my two cents. Rebecca, you got uh, other examples? Yeah. So a lot of things that are uh, certainly in the marketing uh, realm are very helpful. Um, writing LinkedIn posts, it will help you, you know, take something, you can drop it in and say, I will write me this for this particular um, application, whether or not it's a social post or whether or not you want to do a longer form email to somebody or drafting something up for websites. Um, so it certainly helps with, again, that right as, as a tool, as an assistant to help you write. Um, very important not to let it go on its own. We'll cover that in a minute, but <laughs> it's a great tool. Um, also, again, translation. Some of the things that it can do on the fly are very helpful, uh, especially as you get into multimedia and creating multimedia content. Oh, that's, that's great. And again, when uh, the follow-up email goes out, um, we actually have a link to, uh, I, I think kind of it's like future, futurepedia, I think we called it. Anyway, it's literally got thousands of AI tools broken up by category. So you can go through and, you know, kind of see what some different folks are doing there. Um, David, I think you actually had an example for this too, right? Oh, I did. Yes. Um, I was actually just using it, using it the other day to help with developing a new job description. And I was talking with a potential client and they said, you know, I don't really have this formulated yet, but I'm kind of looking for this and I'd like to have some of that and some of this. So I just started, you know, afterward plugging that in. And it was amazing how it developed a really great draft of a job description to work uh, to work with. That's excellent. So that brings us sort of naturally to the next topic, which is organizational chatbots. And um, and the reason is because for a lot of organizations, when they're thinking, well, how can we apply AI or how can we apply, you know, some of the emerging technology like ChatGPT, you know, one of the natural places to go is, okay, well, we could build a chatbot. So we have a poll for this. Um, and uh, this is just to get a sense of where your organizations are at. Um, you know, have you developed an AI chatbot? Um, have you developed a non-AI chatbot? Uh, legacy technology, right? Uh, and, um, or you haven't, or, you know, you plan to. So yeah, if you guys fill that out real quick, that would be great. Um, while we go into that, so 
you know, it's it's interesting. I'll give you all a couple of case studies on this one real quick. So PwC uh, actually came out and announced that it had deployed an AI chatbot for 4,000 of its lawyers. Um, and this was really designed to help lawyers with contract analysis, regulatory compliance work, due diligence, and, you know, and, and other legal advisory and consulting services, you know, and they're looking to even expand it now beyond that. Um, in a similar vein, uh, KPMG launched its own AI powered chatbot um, to help employees rapidly find internal exports across the organization um, to, again, just for efficiencies purposes, things like that. Um, Rebecca, I know that... Um, before uh, your new uh, role, um, I know SPE was uh, also uh, looking at doing some different things there. Right, they were kind of in looking into the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Um, for those of us who aren't totally into acronyms, um, but the they were looking at taking a um, and they were testing it against ChatGPT and also a private AI company working with kind of going through our historical files and ask a question, get an answer for anything that kind of came out of our database of FSPE's database of, of historical content. So it's um, it's interesting to see what they've been able to do, but it was just a, a pop-up, ask a question, get an answer sort of a chat bot. Um, they've also done it for some customer service ideas, but that's always kind of a, a question mark. There's a lot of chat bots out there. People still like to to speak sometimes to a real person, but a lot of associations are looking for chatbots just to help with some of the basic questions that associations often get. How do I log in? How do I help this? How do I renew myself? Um, can you help me find this particular piece of, um, you know, content on the website? Those sorts of things. People are beginning to experiment with chatbots on, on that scale. So uh, thank, thank you, Rebecca, on that. And then um, looking at the poll results. So it sounds like very small number of people already have them in place. Um, we have more people, about 20%, who are looking to get one built. A uh, vast majority don't have plans for one yet. Uh, and then, of course, some people who don't know. So, um, which is pretty typical, I think, for where we are right now. You know, this is sort of one of the, the key topics here. Actually, let me not give that one away just yet. Here's one of the key topics that we've talked a lot about is when it comes to different organizations, particularly associations and professional societies, um, where, where is this going to come into play? So I think, you know, Khan or Rebecca, if you guys want to comment on this, you know, are, are associations going to be building these tools in-house? How are they going to get access to a lot of the technology? Yeah, I'll chime in. The, the challenge here is, you know, training your chatbot and exposing your data, your organizational data to the chatbot to train it to answer questions and to be able to intelligently sort through that. So it's going to take a lot of uh, training and in a lot of corrections, human intervention, uh, to make sure that the answers are correct and the answers answer the question. Sometimes they don't answer the question. Uh, and so I think you have to be very cautious there, but I don't think most organizations have the expertise to pull this off. So it's going to be a third part. You know, we're going to have to work with someone and you're going to have to have agreements that are in place that aligns with your value and your data privacy and your data access and things like that so there's a lot of things and we'll touch on that later too uh to think about when you engage with a third party about your data how they're using it and who owns it right so that's my two cents rebecca i don't know if you want to chime in on some of your experiences from that Right, so that's probably the thing we'll, we will touch on a little bit later um, in the webinar, but again, it's going to come back to if you want a chat bot that kind of ask a question, get an answer, it's going to come down to working with a great third party, because you have to trust that their language model that they've implemented, their algorithms are going to match up and give you the right um, answers back, because that's going to be key. And so back to that training and iterative process. Um, and again, it's not something that it falls within the association's mission that much. So while it is a deliverable, it is important to find a great partner, one that you really trust the technology and that continues to move it forward if you do create those relationships. So, And, that, and that's, that's our um, observation as well, is that within the, the technology ecosystem, that a lot of the different technology providers are going to be bringing and incorporating these tools in. And that will make them accessible then within the larger association uh, community. Um, you know, and I can give some examples here, just speaking from our experience with Results Direct. So, because we get to work with hundreds of associations, you know, all over the world, you know, when this all launched back in November, you know, we started looking at okay, how 
could this be incorporated in uh, to better serve, you know, the organizations that we work with? And, you know, and there's a couple of areas that we're seeing that opportunity. Um, search is one of them. Uh, I think search is going to get a pretty big overhaul because of these new uh, technologies now that we have access to. Uh, content personalization is another really big one that we see. Content recommendations, um, the ability to better access things like knowledge bases, um, you know, et cetera. Those are the areas that we're seeing the biggest impact because primarily the tools that we offer um, have to do with websites, uh, mobile apps for events, mobile apps for year-round member engagement. The natural places that we started to see was how could we better serve you know, the individuals at the organizations that were populating this content and how could we best serve the uh, end users? And it was some interesting early experiments. Um, so I'll give a quick example here. So one of the first things we thought was, hey, why don't we take our entire knowledge base? We'll feed it in, uh, if you will, to uh, to chat GPT. And, and there's a lot of technical that goes beyond that statement. Uh, and, um, you know, and then that way, when someone has a question of, you know, well, how do I upload sessions to my event? Um, you know, instead of having to look it up, they'd be able to just, you know, get a straight up instructions, right? So our first iterations of that, that's exactly what we did. And it's, it literally gave perfect instructions on how to run that task, right? But then we asked it another feature question, you know, hey, how do you do, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it gave perfectly good description and instructions on how to do that, except that was a feature that our product didn't offer. And uh, so the technical term for that is hallucination. And that's going to be one of the big challenges that uh, Khan was referencing. And we're going to talk about more in a few minutes, which is when it is, because remember, chat GPT, it's, it's just predicting what's the next word uh, probability wise that it should put based on the prompts you're giving it. And so that was a challenge. And it took several iterations for us to start figuring out how to get the tool to not lie to people, um, which was which was very interesting. Um, you know, one of the other things that we looked at is say, at an event, you know, could we um, could we allow for a tool, a chatbot, if you will, or a content recommendation tool to be able to better uh, guide, you know, attendees on how they could get the most out of the event. So this is actually uh, our, uh, it's in beta still as well, uh, like everything with ChatGPT. But, you know, this is an example of that you know, where this was the access conference where we gave this talk live and in person. And, you know, the idea is, you know, hey, what sessions should I attend to learn about AI? And so it went through the content and it came back with some recommendations. Now, what I really like about it is that you can see some of the context of, of what it's saying here. So obviously ours was, you know, an AI talk. So it put us up at the top, but, you know, then it talks about multimedia content creation. While not directly about AI, it might touch on how AI could be used in content cr creation. Well, how did it know that? Well, because it has this, you know, backdrop of all of this data that it's consumed. And so it basically, um, you know, it was able to extrapolate based on what we had asked it. I mean, I love it even says, you know, remember to check the event schedule for exact time and locations, you know, so that it, it understands the context of I'm at an event. So I thought that one was really interesting. This one actually even more interesting to give it a better prompt. And prompt engineering is a whole nother topic we won't touch on today. I attended a webinar last week that was an hour long and it just talked about prompt engineering of like, how do you ask ChatGPT good questions? But this one says, you know, I work as a meeting planner. What sessions would help me be better at my job and what speakers should I try to meet? So now it's giving it some better context. And so again, it went through and it identified sessions and identified speakers. Um, you know, and then of course I love at the bottom, you know, remember networking is key. Don't miss out on opportunities. Connect during lunch breaks and the closing reception. Well, how did it know there was a closing reception? Because it had consumed the schedule. So again, just a, a neat to kind of see sort of how it assimilates and kind of puts that information together. So anyway, so long story on organizational chatbots and, and sort of how these tools are going to get implemented. And we'll wrap up this with some, some ideas of next steps. But, you know, in this one, it's definitely, you know, talking to the different providers that you're using, figure out how they're implementing it. And now we're going to get into the fun stuff, which is uh, talking about uh, publishing and policy. Uh, I, I will open this up before I turn it over to Rebecca to say that when we gave this talk live, it was all excitement until we got to this part. And then by the time we were done with the policy and the, and the, and the publishing part, we're like, oh, AI is not good at all. You know, so, uh, all right, so strap in because <laughs> 
because now here's all the important stuff that you need to think about as we're on this journey together. So, uh, so Rebecca, let's go you. ahead and yeah, we have a poll question for us to kick off, which is, are you using it? When we gave this talk originally, we were talking to a group that had a lot of publishing in their association, but you put things out, whether it's a magazine or anything else. So are you using it? Do you have members who, who write papers for you or write content for you? So having a, um, how many of you actually have a policy for your member authors when they are writing for you, when they use AI tools? Um, so yeah, so that's been one of the interesting ones. My background comes from the publishing group. So working in technical papers and articles, journals, books, that sort of thing. And it's certainly seeing an impact from um, ChatGPT and the ability to create content. And a lot of that, if you've gone on Amazon, you will find, I think, something like 300 books telling you how to write books using ChatGPT. What's the answers? Ah, so we have a predominant number of you who aren't using it in publishing or, or don't have members. I'm, I'll cover this fast then, um, but for those of you who do and have an interest, um, one thing it's important to remember is there's two things, which is if you are and do have publishing that your member members write as authors for you, that having a policy on what they can do with that AI generation is important. So Michael, you wanna go to the next slide for me real quick? So. AI content policy. So if you all, if your members are writing articles for your magazine, if they're writing technical papers for you, it's important to have a rule that says either they can't be listed as an author. That is one thing all the scholarly publishing group came out with. AI chat GPT cannot be an author on a paper or an article. Um, it can't be held accountable for what is generated. And as I think we've mentioned already, it can hallucinate. Um, an AI tool can't sign a publishing agreement. It can't get decide to give you the copyright so that then you own it or the license to distribute it. It just doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, the other thing, to just a quick thing to include if you are looking at a policy is to make sure that if AI content is used within the manuscript, that it is thoroughly vetted, fact-checked, and most importantly, that they say they've used it. OK, I use chat GPT for this or I use a large language model, you know, generative AI to assist with the writing of this paper. That's a little different when you ask it to write content for you versus maybe something you use for editing, which a lot of people have been using in scholarly publishing for a long time. So that's not something that's typically asked to be disclosed if you're using it as a tool just to help you, say, edit grammarly, a lot of things out there that, that people are very used to using. But if you're using it actually to ask it a question, how do I do this or how would I do that? And it writes you back a paragraph and says, hey, put this in scholarly format and take a section of that out or do something with it, you need to disclose it. Um, authors of the manuscript will be held for responsible. This is a little bit of a nuts and bolts association thing for, or sorry, publishing thing for scholarly publishing, which is authors of manuscripts should be held for any errors. Even though they use ChatGPT or another language model to help them get the answer, or they may have used it in their paper, they're still ultimately responsible for the words that they write and they submit in under their name. So they will be held responsible for anything in there. If it's wrong, they're still on the hook. Last thing is just really, it's, it, this is, comes back to it. Give credit where credit is due. Quick thing that Michael loves to point out, which is when we did this talk, I went in and asked Dali, which is a the same company that does ChatGPT, which is OpenAI, has another product called Dali 2, I think is what it's called now. And it actually, um, I said, give me a image of a robotic hand writing on a paper. And it, de it designed this beginning to end. It created it wholesale and gave it to me. But if you'll notice, I did reference where I got it from and gave it the acknowledgement. Even APA style is beginning to say, here's how you um, reference something if it is generated by OpenAI or ChatGPT. So you'll see that those are a couple of references and we will include the information on how to do it with APA style as well as Chicago Manual of Style for those of you with the background in publishing. So I've covered that quickly, but we'll give you those links so you have them afterwards if you wanna go back and look at some of the policies. Quick note on this before we leave, which is the fact that this is adjusting as people begin to use it more and more. So anytime you do create a policy or you look at that, you will probably need to just leave yourself some flexibility to understand that how people are using it is adapting and what people's acceptance of that use is. So your policies will probably have to adjust. 
The other thing I will say, just as a quick note, for those of you in publishing or just ChatGPT in general, it's also good to have an internal policy for your staff on how they use ChatGPT and content from that. It is worth drafting one up or at least an expectation and guidelines for what people should be doing. A lot of younger staff are using it. They may not always check it. Um, and they may rely too heavily on it. And so it's important to make sure that you've been very clear with your own staff about what the expectations are. All right, so uh, Khan, over to you, policies and ethics. All right, let's fly through this real quick. Next slide, oh, poll question first. And this is what uh, Rebecca was talking about, is do you have a policy on your staff for AI tools? And we'll dive deep a little bit more of what's going on there. But before that, uh, you can answer the policy. I'll go into the quick review. So there are two leading bodies in the AI space that we are aware of in democracy. China has their own policy. They're not willing to share it with everybody. But uh, the EU's general strategy is to lead the government and be really cautious. And so they've identified like eight areas of concerns um, and now to the next slide. And the U.S. is really kind of free market where the corporations are leading and government's more reactive, right? So these are the eight areas of concerns that EU is going to be really writing clear laws around. And you can see they're either critical infrastructure or dealing with human processes. Um, I would say is just like uh, GDPR, right? I think EU is going to lead on this. And so that's why... I think we need to keep our eyes open on what the EU is doing because overall, it will come to the United States. California is adopting the GDPR. Canada has adopted a lot of the GDPR stuff. So uh, I think their regulation is going to be more robust. So just heads up on this stuff. It's it's going to come and we're going to have to deal with it. So just be aware that that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, next slide. Hallucination. We talked about this. I would love my son to come up to me one day and he will. He'll say, Dad, I'm hallucinating. I didn't lie to you, but I was hallucinating, right? <laughs> because that's what hallucinating is. Um, there were lawyers who uh, used ChatGP to file a motion. And the opposing uh, uh, attorneys were trying to do their research and response. And they said they can't find these court cases that was in the motion. And they're like, you know, they, they showed it to the judge. And the judge basically uh, reprimanded and referred their two attorneys to the bar for disbarment because they literally had their motion written by ChatGPT and it made up court cases, literally made up court cases. It was crazy. Um, so, so that's it. The other one was, you know, uh, you can actually create malicious code in the beginning. They put some guardrails on there, but ChatGPT can write code, by the way. So coding is going to be heavily impacted by ChatGPT. And you can write code that goes wrong, malicious code. So be aware of those things. Uh, moving on to biases. Um, so one of my friends uh, did know about ChatGPT and AI, and I was like, we were talking, and she's like, I can't get a lot of pictures. You know, like Rebecca didn't have time to sit down and you know dress up and all that stuff. I said, let's try to do something on a image generator. Uh, she uh, she runs an organization nonprofit for people with Down syndrome, and she said we want to have our, our folks be more professional. So I typed down this prompt: Down syndrome engineer engineers. And this is what it came up, the four images, right? And you can see that uh, in this picture, all you would see that all engineers wear hard hats and have high, or three of the four have very bright vested. How many engineers do you know wear hard hats and have vested sitting in their desk? Maybe our civil friends, right? And our construction folks, but not all engineers. And why does engineers have to be male, right? Why can't they be and why do they are not people of color too? So there are a lot of biases within these systems because they were fed information that did not expose them to a lot. Yes, thank you for pointing it out, Rebecca. They also all wear glasses too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm an engineer, right? I just forgot my hard hat and my vest. So those are some of the things we really have to look at. Uh, you know, what is the data that's trained on? Does the data contain bias? Does the data, is, does the algorithm uh, hallucinate. So you'll have to check, and that's why you have to do these things. Uh, next slide. So we talked about you know some of the templates. I mentioned this earlier. Sherm, Sherm came out with one template, and basically it said early on, do not use ChatGPT. That was their recommendation. 
do not use chat GPT. But of course, everybody's using it. Sure, it's like, okay, you need to have something in. Now they've updated. Um, they have three options. A, they kept the do not use chat GPT. Uh, two, limited use in certain cases. Uh, and three, open use with some guardrails. So overall, I would say for your organization, as you think about the policies, you know, look at where your risks are, where's your data, who has access to it, how do you protect your data? So I'll show there are some questions and we'll go into it, Mark, some other asks, you know, how do you protect? It's through your agreements with third parties. Be very clear of who owns the data, who owns and what do they do with that data after you're done with the contract? You know, they need to purge it. And I would say you need to audit that. Because there's a very famous case that I won't name because I was told it's too risky for our group, but they were, uh, they were, let's say, a sugar daddy site where people thought uh, in their contracts and terms, they said, oh, yeah, you request this, we'll remove your data. And it did not remove their data. And so uh, all those people got exposed before that. But a couple of things to think about as you think about AI. A, it, AI is going to impact multiple parts of the organization. So multidisciplinary, innovative team, people who care about AI, want to learn more about it, you should put them together and kind of lead, have that group lead your thoughts on AI. Definitely, definitely have humans with AI decision making, human alignment, disclosure and consent form on your stuff. If you're using AI to train it, you should let your folks know. Think about data control. Who has it? Who owns it? How long it stays? What do you do with the information afterwards? Is it yours? Is it theirs? Uh, you're not going to be an AI expert. Third parties the way to go. Make sure that alignment is valued. Do auditing and validation that they live up to their contract. All right. Uh, next, I think we're going to jump into uh, another topic. Yeah, and and I think one thing, just Con, that's probably helpful, um, just to mention, kind of piggyback off that, is that. I've heard two, two that stated two ways, right? So one is chat GPT today. It's kind of like having an intern, you know, that it, it gives you stuff, but you should probably check it. And then the second one, which I liked even better was uh, don't ask chat GPT to do something that you couldn't do yourself because then you'll never know if it's right or wrong. Right. Um, Jessica, I don't know. Do we have the poll results from, uh, from that section just real quick, just to, just to let everybody know what we found out. Okay, so policies and ethics. So yeah, so 80% do not have one uh, at this time. So uh, so the important, important topic for everyone's organization. All right, so let's uh, let's jump through here. So we're gonna start uh, landing the plane, but uh, the role of associations, we have our final poll uh, here. So uh, have you identified ways that AI is impacting your members' careers? So while you're filling that out, uh, we'll, we'll jump kind of right in here because uh, really, you know, when we look at the role of associations, and and maybe this does not apply to everybody on the webinar, but I know a lot of uh, the folks attending today uh, work for professional or trade associations. Um, that's an important position. Uh, so I don't know, Rebecca, do you want to maybe kick us off here and, and we'll banter for a quick minute about this? Right. So, I mean, the role of the association at it as it relates to AI is beyond just using tools ourselves. It comes back to really kind of making sure that we are working with AI as it applies to our members. Um, I mentioned earlier, obviously, in my previous organization and Woodside and what they're doing with AI, a lot of oil and gas companies really going through that, their historical archives and, and asking large language models to help them distill down their information. So it's beginning to change how our, in, our industries are working that we support, and it's changing the jobs of the individuals that, that a lot of us have um, and work with. Let me say it that way. But the other thing is, is that it's giving you the real opportunity to amplify the voice of your members. They're real people. They're subject matter experts. It's important to remember that that can't be replaced. Back to the fact that you have the subject matter experts and essentially ChatGPT is an intern level. Um, it can give you basic information, but you really have an opportunity here to highlight the fact that you have human beings with a wealth of knowledge and a lot of expertise that you're not necessarily getting at the AI level if you just rely on that. So it is an opportunity for associations to amplify the voice of, 
of humans. And I would say it the same way when everybody started getting a ton of email, we thought, hey, this is so much easier. Everybody can just email, you can put it on blast. But what turned out to happen is if I get a hard copy of something in the mail, it has a lot more value and a lot more resonance. So you found that things just shifted. I think you'll find the same thing happens with our human members. So just remember that in the role of the association. Michael, I'm gonna throw it back to you now. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll comment on that too. You know, one thing, having worked in the association space now for a couple of decades, you know, I will say that there's opportunity here. You know, this is an emerging technology. Um, I have I have heard it compared, you know, the whole emergence now of, of AI and, and a lot of these tools to, you know, discovering flight, you know, so this isn't just a fad. I mean, this is really the next big revolution that's happening. And so it's going to impact the industries that that you all work in, uh, those those members, those people are going to be impacted. We're going to see workforce automation. It could result in some, uh, it, well, it's going to result in retooling in terms of skill sets. Um, it may, you know, may show some workforce compression. You know, there was a, a really interesting study came out recently, um, and, and Khan, I think you were the one that mentioned it, so tell me if I get this wrong, but that it was in radiology, and they had run... Right. Um, scans, basically cancer scans through an AI program. And it ended up being 20% more accurate than radiologists, you know? And so again, you know, you look at something. So if, if this is the, you know, the, you know, radiology association, these are the kind of things that getting the members prepared for what's coming. It is one of the key roles of the association. And then the other one to echo what Rebecca said is, you know, we're, and, and what Khan was, was highlighting was policy changes that, you know, really, again, it is the voice of these industries. Um, you know, we live in a weird time where it's like, you really don't know who or what to trust anymore. I think the general population uh, knows not to trust social media. They know not to trust a Google search that it's 100% accurate. I think we all know Wikipedia can be updated by anyone. Um, but with a lot of these tools, you know, and things that are coming out, it's, it's, it's really knowing who to trust. And associations, they have the voice of credibility. And so again, it's just important, especially as we're advocating both to the public, but also then to policymakers. So, um, all right. And uh, okay, this is good. So yeah, so a third, a third of folks already uh, identified ways that it's going to impact and and we'll see that number go up <laughs> tremendously. So, so Khan, why don't you uh, land our plane here uh, as we wrap this up, um, you know, with maybe some just ideas of next steps and then, uh, and then we'll... Uh, do as many questions as we can. Just real quick, uh, we have it it's in our resource. Pew Research did a pretty decent sized study on how AI will impact the different industries. So just check that out and see that it impacts your folks. As we know, change is coming. It's going to be here and it's constant. Right? So, next slide. I think we all accept that as school leaders. So, here's our kind of collective recommendations. Make sure that you understand where your ethical principles. So they call it ethical AI. So here's some of the concepts around ethical AI. A, you know, what is fair? Be transparent. Be accountable. And really define, you know, and disclose what is privacy for your organization. So as you interact with AI, people know like what to expect. And you cannot remove the human aspect. So those are kind of the ethical, they call it ethical AI. I'm sorry, go back uh, to the previous slide. Yeah, and then be very sure about data governance. Where the desire, who owns it, who can keep it. Uh, as someone was mentioning, you know, it's learning on your data. Do they own it at the end of the day? You know, you take that raw data back. Do they own the, the, the derivatives? And so you, you must be very clear about that. Check for biases. We talked about, you know, the pictures of an engineer. Why can't there be women? Why can't there be people of color? So have a larger base, more inclusive group looking at your stuff when you're testing an audit. Be very transparent, you know, because one of the things that chat GPT people busted on is like, we don't know what is trained on your data, right? We don't know how you get to these conclusions. And if we know how the sauce is made, the sauce is, then we can predict a little bit better. Human oversight at the end of the day of accountability for your organization. You're not going to remove humans. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, privacy and security. Uh, we can talk more about that. I mean, these are so, I mean, we can spend probably the whole session on each one of these topics. Uh, as I mentioned before, third parties are going to be probably the expert of your AI tools and how you integrate with them. So you're going to have to have those honest conversations about all the stuff we talked about. And do they align with where you want it to be? And do they have the right tool for you? Uh, 
continuous learning. This stuff is evolving so fast. Uh, so that's why I think it's important to have people on your team who likes this stuff and want to learn and can be kind of the, the lead point on this. Uh, you know, it, Rebecca mentioned that as association, we must really engage with the broader uh, public, especially in our area, especially our members, try to help educate them how this is coming down the pipeline. And then at the end of the day, auditing, auditing, even though they tell you they erase your data, <laughs> they may not have erased your data. But I will stop there. I think we're into uh, the Q&A section. Thank you for hanging out 55 minutes with us as we scream through this really dense topic. Thank you, David, for having us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for doing this. And uh, that was a great presentation. We had some questions uh, from the um, from the group, and I actually put those in the chat so you could all see those and and uh, have a chance to respond to them if you don't feel like they were heard. I'll I'll take the first one real quickly, just and okay. if everybody will notice, that's again that's not really me, or it's a version of me that AI helped create. So um, on the screen, but any use of AI tools for contract reviews, similar to summarizing a. Um, an in-depth article, you certainly can use it to do that. I would caution you against doing that because the, any con person who reads a contract knows the devil's in the details and it's going to skip the details. So the answer is I, I would be very cautious about doing that unless you were trying to take one that you fully understand and maybe move it into a PowerPoint slide if you wanted to take some information out of it. But I wouldn't use it for going on instead of uh, for contract review simply because the, it's it's probably going to miss the details. Here's what I will add to that real quick. You might want to ask your attorney if they use chat GPT to summarize for them, <laughs> to, to lower the, the hours that they charge you. That might be more efficient. And the onus is on your attorney to make it right. right? <laughs> so something to, to reduce costs, yet still have the liability in your attorney. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm going to add one thing in there too, which is that you know, if you're using the public chat interface, um, you know, you do want to click the box that says don't use this to train the model. And if it's proprietary or sensitive information, I would not be using the public interface at all to put information in. Um, there's just, you know, you don't want that getting into the collective, if you will. Um, there are tools out there, of course, and, and ways of doing it that allow you to uh, not have that information be tracked. Um, you know, ChatGPT just literally launched uh, their enterprise level service, for instance. Um, you know, so they have some different tiers. The different tiers have different privacy levels. So just to be aware, but that public, you know, web interface or the app, I would not put proprietary or sensitive information in there. Yeah, I think it comes back to, again, the policies that you need to have in place internal for your staff so they understand not what to put in as well. Yeah, um, exactly. certain meetings that you have, you might want help summarizing and doing notes on. You certainly shouldn't be dropping yeah. in the in the free version. I mean, I'll even I'll even go one step further on it. Um, is that like so? For instance, one of the things that we're building out right now is a tool within the event app to say, you know, who should I network with, you know, at this event, right? And um, which is going to be super useful, super helpful. We're not even going to send the names to ChatGPT. We'll literally turn it into a code, send it in, get it back, and then put it back into the person's name because we're just wanting to like make sure there's just no way that privacy issues are are going to be a factor. So, so again, it's some thoughtfulness there is important. Uh, who wants yeah. the next? I'll, I'll take Craig's uh, question about uh, intellectual properties. Yeah. The court's going to figure that out. I mean, all these are authors and folks are super data, right? How the sausage is made. The court will determine what is copyright, what is derived data, what is created data. And that will provide some legal clarity of where anything is. So I think my answer is let's wait and see what the court says before we try to jump in and turn it back. Uh, Mark, our friend Mark. Dorsey, uh, I love this. Uh, yes, uh, you can train, and this is where it goes back to knowing the data and having that conversation with that third party, whoever you're using, right? How is the data being used? Can it only be used on our set of data? Uh, and what happens when it learns that? Will it, can it quote, somebody asks, unlearn, and that's in the algorithm. You have to ask those questions. And you can set the algorithm I would set up to unlearn, go back this time, but ChatGPT will disclaim the public version. 
that it doesn't know anything beyond 2021, right? The private, the, the paid chat GDT knows a little bit more. I need to get an update for uh, Hopefully that answers the question. Mark. Well, and one thing to add to that, Con, was I found that chat GPT, I, I haven't asked it recently when I asked it a couple of months ago, though, it was a little cagey on when I was trying to figure out if it had ingested content that the yeah. previous society I worked for had publicly available kind of previews, abstracts of that. And it was like, I don't know where I got the information. I trained on a lot of things. Yeah. I, it was actually incredibly cagey. I kept asking it questions. And the more I asked, it was like, I don't know. It was like a little toddler. I don't know. I got well, it it's a legal risk, right? You don't want right. to call GPT to the sand and say, did you use my book to write it? Right. Chat so, GPT, you're going to say, yes, we use your book. Right. <laughs> Here's, so. It won't tell you where I got the information. So, yeah. um, but it, most AI can be told to forget. It's very important back to that last question on that, it, which is include that in your in the agreement you do that allows anybody to work on your IP or get access to that or to ingest it. It's very, very, very important. You have clear language in your agreement on that. And the other thing I think you're going to end up having to do is watch it the same way we did for plagiarism, for other things getting out there with, you know, research gate, a lot of the things that when they were first churning around for, for content getting out there, you're just going to have to keep an eye on it and see what's being put out there and see if your information somehow manages to make it in. And let me just say, um, we are at the bottom of the hour and I see that some attendees are leaving us, um, but we do want to take the chance to thank everybody for joining us. Again, please feel free here are the emails to our panelists. Feel free to ask them any questions. We will be sending, I think Michael said this at the beginning, we will be sending a follow-up email with all of the, the wonderful websites that we can offer you, a lot of resources, and um, also this recording will be attached to our Sterling Martin uh, website and we will send you the direct link so that you guys can refer back to this but we again want to thank you and please join us for our next sterling martin associates webinar uh for september keep an eye out for on social media and any invites that we're going to send but we will continue to answer these questions for the next couple minutes so for those of you that ask them we hope you're still there so we can answer your questions so uh yeah, I'll uh, I'll take uh, just real quick for Jason. Um, I did pop my email into the chat. Uh, I do actually have a couple of, of good articles that talk about prompt engineering. So if you want to shoot me an email, I'll, I'll send that to you. Um, you want to move on? Let's see. We've got a, a copywriting question. That seems like a Rebecca topic for James. Rebecca, are you still there? Rereading it really carefully. Um, when people are when people use ChatGPT for copywriting in organizations, should there be a concern that is ChatGPT an AI brain that's learning how to answer all users based on the input from any other users? So I think we mentioned originally their data set only goes to 2021 right now, at least is available in the free public version. Michael, I'm not sure on the enterprise level if that has any if that's changed on the dates on that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, so it could go if you. It should not, according to ChatGPT, which again, KG, um, it shouldn't have access to proprietary information that you haven't given it a right to do or put out freely on the web, but it has scraped the entire web. So if it's behind login, technically it shouldn't be able to get to it. Um, I don't know the underneath of that. So um, yeah. Rebecca, but, quick question for you on that point. The data goes so far through 2021, is that correct? Sorry, did I say that wrong? Yes, through 2021. It goes to September of 2021 is what I, I believe is is on there on the free version. I didn't know if there's any difference, Michael, on the um, you all know enterprise yeah. level. Yeah, but, they updated it. They updated for uh, the enterprise I guess, to yeah. more recent. Oh, Maybe for the paid version, it is updated. Correct. It's it's a more recent. Version. Ah, good to know. But they still won't tell you what they trained, so. I was going to say, but I think the, the main message, though, goes back to if it's proprietary information, don't you don't want to put that into the public interface. Um, if it is important information, you just want to do your due diligence to make sure that, you know, the tool that you are using is not going to retain that. I mean, it goes back, Rebecca, to, to the, what you had uh, shared with us about um, SPE and, and uh, Watson. Um, I don't know if we told that story on this webinar, but, you know. Um, oh, you know, yeah, we didn't. Like, yeah, maybe. So we yeah. actually, so SPE did a 
wanted Watson approached us and wanted to ingest all of our information uh, from the previous, from all the way back through the historical archive and include that so that the major oil companies they were going out and talking to could potentially incorporate that in a way. And they they sold this as this would be this great thing. And I was like, that's great, but Watson can't unlearn what it learned. So we had discussions on, on again, putting very big parameters around what they could and couldn't do, but they couldn't at the time, which was 2019, they couldn't guarantee they could get the information back out. Watson wouldn't unlearn it. So again, that's one of the things to think about is it's it's a knowledge base. It's learning that is part of, of what it's doing. So it doesn't unlearn that well as well. So just to think about that again, as you come down to your agreements, we ultimately decided not to move forward with Watson at the time. We would have put a, a much different agreement in place because things, and they have begun to figure out ways that they can remove um, some content, but I think that's still a work in progress. I, Michael, I, that's beyond my knowledge base on that one, but we're just, we were very cautious about it and we didn't feel like we had the the level of comfort that that our information wouldn't have walked out the door and we wouldn't have had any ability to do with anything afterwards. Yeah. And sometimes you don't put your full membership database on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. contact information and all that stuff. I, I think it's good to know where that line is for your organization. <laughs> and be able to say no, right? Right, because and just be very, it. yeah, be intentional and think towards the future of it. Sometimes yeah. the short answer is no in, in the short run until you feel very comfortable that you know where you're going. Yeah. Uh, there was a, an ask for a sample AI policy for staff. Yeah, so yeah. I'll take that one. Uh, what I'll, I, I believe it's in the resource I sent, uh, the, and you can Google this, uh, sure, it's public. They are starting to go private, so it's starting to be behind the paywall, some of the AI uh, templates that they're going to share. So obviously, they're trying to monetize some of the stuff that there is currently. Uh, those three options that I talked about, prohibitive, uh, limited use, and then more of an open use. So you can Google that. That should be public still. But I saw that they were moving some stuff behind the paywall, so you don't want to share it. And you won't be able to uh, get that stuff. But I, I believe it's in our resources. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if there's other questions, David. Did you see any other questions that people had along the way? No, that was it. Uh, no open questions. Okay. Excellent. We're only seven minutes over. That's perfect. <laughs> I'm hey, impressed. We, yeah, we, we had 75 minutes of uh, access, so we're, we're, we're faster than that. <laughs> we flew through it, yeah. This well, is well, great. Thank you, so Thank you much again, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Hi, adventure. Thank you. <laughs>